ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for uh, coming. Um, it's been, I'm Rory Arrow, it's been my great privilege for the past two and a half years to be making a film about a man who I think will probably be seen as one of the most important political thinkers of our generation. I can, I'd love to read you a piece from the, the Times today, which describes uh, Jean's work. And it says, not perhaps since Machiavelli has a book had such impact in shifting the balance of power between the rulers and the ruled. Unlike Machiavelli, however, Jean Sharp is not advising princes how to hold on to power. He is telling millions living under dictatorship how to liberate themselves. Um, how to Start a Revolution, the film, has been doing the film festival tour around the world. And um, I've been consistently berated for not asking many of the questions I should, uh, should have asked. So I'm delighted to be able to um, redress some of the balance tonight. So first of all, we're going to show you uh, uh, the trailer of the film, and then um, we're going to have a conversation with Jean. My name is Gene Sharp, and this is the work I do. This is a technique of combat. It is a substitute for war and other violence. As we speak, somebody is doing it in Iran. As we speak, somebody is doing it in Egypt. As we speak, somebody is doing it in Venezuela. I'm telling you the facts I know. To be counted as a threat to a tyrant is a matter of pride, I would say. It means we're effective. It means we're relevant. It means out of this very small office, we produce work uh, that, that threatens regimes. Gene Sharp's tactics and, and, um, and, and theories are being practiced on the streets of Syria as we speak now. It shows that what Gene was talking about year after year after year, there are realistic alternatives to violent conflict. Unless they have something instead of violence and war, they will go back for violence and war every time. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Gene Sharp. Gene, welcome back to London. I think you spent uh, many sort of happy years here yourself as a, as a young man. Tell me, where did it all start? What made you want to do this kind of work? I didn't know this kind of work. I worried for many years as an undergraduate what I would do and what I should, profession I should accept or choose. And every time I got interested in one, I discovered there was somehow inadequate. And I came into this almost accidentally, but not really. By, I always learned to ask the question behind the question and not be satisfied with the answers I might get. And the questions in, in 1948, 49, 50, 
51 had to do with the Second World War, Nazism, the Holocaust, had to do with Stalin in the Soviet Union, had to do with, do with European colonialism that claimed ownership of most of the rest of the world, of racial segregation in the United States, <coughs> of people often feeling helpless and powerless, of the very beginnings, the very earliest beginnings of the civil rights movement, who did lunch counter sit in, for example, in 1949, I think, in Columbus, Ohio, which was in the north, supposedly. I was worried about military conscription because I had become a kind of a pacifist, while worried about the problem, what do you do if you are attacked? So in writing my letters to my draft board, I remember I wasn't just writing about war. I Somehow in those letters, totalitarianism came in to the wording. So with that mixture, and also we knew a little bit about Gandhi. We knew a little bit about the nonviolent struggle in India. And we didn't know much about other kinds of nonviolent struggle. So when you put those problems together, and those old answers being inadequate, and in trying to learn more. And the more you learned, you mo the more I learned there was to learn. And I kept trying to do that. And in, in, 19, in the early 1950s, the Korean War broke out, and you conscientiously objected to that war, and you were arrested by the FBI. Can you tell us about your arrest and what you were doing at that time, and then oh, what happened? Uh, I had chosen a particular kind of conscience objection, the most obnoxious kind, I guess, existed, <laughs> of civil disobedience. You know, I could have got exemption as a conscience objection. The U.S. laws allowed for that without much of a problem. But I was determined to, not to say, well, let me out, but take them, it's okay. And. So I refused to fill out more applications for country subjective status. I refused to carry a draft card. I refused to report for physical examination. And I, this originally started in Ohio. And this time I was living in Brooklyn, New York. And then I was working there. I was doing studies part-time on Gandhi working on my first book on Gandhi, which I think I completed in 1965, only published in India. Three case histories of Gandhi's use of non -Nazi. three very different cases. And inevitably, I was working part-time. I was a guide to a blind social worker, a kind of seeing, a human seeing eye dog, you know. And eventually, the FBI came and called at my house, and my mother was visiting from Ohio, and she said, well, he's at work. So they found me at the office of the, uh, of the uh, program for assisting the guy, the blind at that time. I, I was reading on the bus, right, traveling this around, guiding this gentleman around. I, I was carrying some collections of Gandhi's writings at the time, the very day they arrested me, and they looked at them rather curiously. So, that, that's it. <laughs> and, then, and then you went to prison and you served nine months. Oh, that was, I was sentenced to two years. <coughs> Technically, they could have given me a 14-year sentence, but they, the judge only gave me two years. Out of that, you're allowed certain for good behavior or something, parole at the end of nine months and nine months and 10 days after my imprisonment, I, I was let loose subject to reporting every week. But during that very dark period, I suppose, in your life when you were being sent to prison, you had a, a very kind of unlikely mentor and source of support and that was Albert Einstein. Yes, Albert Einstein, <laughs> I never met him. I got scolded by the executive of his estate 
years later, for not having gone down to Princeton, New Jersey, to see him. But I thought, well, that's too much, and you have to get special permission to travel outside of your court district. So I waited, and then I was shocked. One day, went to read the headlines of the paper that he was gone. But he had, in his life, he had first been a war resister, not a pacifist exactly, a war resister. And then, as a Jew from Germany, he was well aware of what the Nazi system was. And he concluded that the military war was necessary to fight it. And that's understandable. But then, after that, he signed this famous letter to Roosevelt that you could take these little things, you couldn't see atoms and make bombs out of them. A very strange conception in some ways. And then he saw what atomic weapons really were. So he became a firm supporter of world government, but also he became very interested in Gandhi. The civil rights situation in the United States in those days was not good. That was the days of Mac Joseph McCarthy, the senator, who was calling all kinds of people in the State Department a communist. And he concluded civil disobedience was necessary to preserve civil liberties in the United States, and Gandhi had lessons. And in his final stage of his life, he said there was no political thinker in our time who merits more serious consideration than Gandhi. And I, so I thought, I just did this book on Gandhi, on what he did in various cases. And I was, I tried a little bit to find a publisher, and uh, of course, no, you heard of state, that kind of a problem. How old were you at this point? 25. Okay. I always have to check back, but I did check back the other day. <laughs> and I said, I'm about to go to jail for such and such. And by the way, I have done this book. I'm having trouble finding a publisher, you know. Would you consider writing a forward to it? Uh, a bit of arrogance, I suppose. It's extreme chutzpah. And he said, well, uh, if I agree with most of it, uh, uh, I might do that. But in the meantime, he agreed to support my position of civil disobedience and military conscription and I was able to use his name in the court trials, if I remember correctly. And, uh, and one of the, the most, uh, I suppose, interesting parts of the story, which I absolutely love, was that um, you came from a, quite a religious family. Your, your father was a minister. Yeah. And they obviously were very worried that their young son was being imprisoned. And Einstein helped comfort your mother, I think, by writing to her. Yes, my mother wrote. It was a shock to my family, but um, and very difficult, and I, did, I wasn't happy about that. But my mother seemed to understand a little bit better than my father did, who came around eventually and say, "I understand now." But my mother did what I guess most Ohio mothers don't do, and she wrote a letter to Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> and. He wrote back to her. These letters and the little bit of correspondence I had with Einstein, they're available. There's a book called Einstein on Peace, edited by Otto Nathan and Heinz Norden. I think it's certainly in libraries. It was in print for many years. I don't know whether it still is. But you'll find those there. And he, he wrote back and very comforting words to her. And that was, that was a big help. And then you moved on, you, you left obviously prison and you went on to do more studies and advanced studies at Oxford University and that's where you say you had your eureka moment and this would be the analysis that would really shape the rest of your career and the work that has, has uh, gone on. You've skipped this point. a whole bunch of years there. I have. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right if you want to skip them, that's all right. <laughs> That particular moment, I, 
The one thing, uh, I was doing work in, first of all, in New York. I used the New York Public Library for old English, Indian and English newspaper accounts of some non long struggles. I also had gone to London to work in Peace News, which then was a significant op the opposition paper. We had a circulation at one point of 16,000 a week. It's now, I'm told it's now down to five, and maybe with a rather different orientation than we had. And from there, I, I had been invited to Norway, the Institute of Philosophy and History of Ideas at the University of Oslo. The first time I was able to do research on nonviolent action as, without having to go to the library in between times of trying to pound boards together to make some money. And what had been missing in my studies, I discovered, I realized in Norway, was I didn't know a damn thing about political power. But I learned that I didn't know, and that's a great advantage to know what you don't know. Because you have a chance of learning, if you want to, and you're not arrogant. So, I, Alan Bullock, the biographer of Hitler, many of you will know of his work. He's the one that admitted me to his college, St. Catherine's. And there I studied power. John Plowman's guided me to reading a large number of very orthodox political theorists. And I learned from all of them, even Hobbes. As some of you know, the, uh, everybody obey. Why did he say that? Because he saw the power of disobeying. And he was frightened. But from all those theories, I learned, Don Plomance guided me, what, are the, what is power? What are the sources of power? What is the nature of revolutions? What is the nature of dictatorships? And on down the line. But the sources of power you could find. I had brought with me from Norway an 1100 page manuscript not done on computers, there weren't any, but typed on a portable typewriter and thin quarto-sized papers, 1,100 pages. And I thought that was basically it, you know. But I had to start to revise that while I was supposed to be working on my Oxford studies, but I had that left over, you know, just a minor thing of a big book, all left over. And Beginning of that analysis, you, you could, those of you who have access to the Politics of Nonviolent Action from 1973 publication, not in the UK, only in the US, I'm hoping to re expand it and get a UK publisher in a couple of years and get a new American, and same American publisher, but a new American edition expanded. There are sources of power. Ah, oh. and I, and, they come from belief that the government has the right to rule. They come from people working in the bureaucracy and the civil service. They come from people operating the economic system of the country. In some cases, they come from the police and the judges. In some extreme cases, the army, which can be used against the, the population of the country and not just foreigners. I did that, and then I went on. I had, what is the nature of this technique? You saw little tidbits of that up there. What are its methods? Different kinds of strikes, boycotts, protests, hunger strikes, picketing, on down the line. And how does it work? How does it, if it succeeds, it may fail. If it fails, why? If it succeeds, why and how? And as I got to that final chapter of the new revision of the 1100 page manuscript, I discovered the mechanism of nonviolent coercion, which I had once thought was heretical. I concluded it's absolutely necessary and absolutely valid. 
There are some regimes that will not give in because they love you. They might give in while they hate you, but you destroy them politically. I discovered that the way that coercion could be established was identical with the beginning analysis I had almost forgot of the sources of power and that this type of struggle takes away the sources of power of even dictatorships. That was the Eureka moment. It was a, quite a shock and in Oxford, up in Headington, in a small room in a, a rented house. My goodness, my, this, this was quite amazing to me. So that was an incredibly exciting moment. Who did you tell? What did you do at that point? Oh, I sat there. <laughs> Just sat there. And you didn't tell anyone? No. <laughs> it was a bit premature. Why, why, why didn't you tell anyone else? That was only a draft manuscript. I don't, I, sometimes I've made mistakes or almost made mistakes by trying to get something that's inadequate published. And if they said no, I'd later hear and that was a good, good idea to say no to that, you know. So that thesis was almost the, that was the, the beginning point of your first big text, which was the, the Politics of Nonviolent Action published in 1973. Yeah, it, it, I had originally had a different thesis topic for my DPhil at Oxford, but I substituted this manuscript. But major reworking, major, major, major. And new cases, new historical examples, new analysis. And that was the debut of something you were very much famous for, and that's the 198 oh, methods. That, and describe how you came up with that, and why is it 198? That was only a small part of okay. this. And I'm afraid they got disproportionately positive identification, you know. People are sort of fascinated by 198 ways they can be obnoxious. <laughs> um, the, I originally had a list of 12 in, when I was working in Norway at the Institute for Social Research. And I had, out of what I had known in this in some of the books on nonviolent action, come up with a list of 12, or maybe it was 18. I was invited, rather surprisingly, to Africa in the spring of 1960. And Kwame Nkrumah's Ghana, he was president, he was still a Democrat. They had a conference for positive action on peace and security in, Af in Africa. Positive action was his way of saying nonviolent action, plus legal or constitutional means. And I took that, the manuscript paper with me and showed it to some people from South Africa and from Somalia. And the next day, they said they had they the up all night reading it. I was a bit surprised. It was only a small list, and only the best I could do at the time. But somehow, that showed me that there was practical relevance for what I was trying to do because it showed them you can, it's not just be nonviolent. Be nonviolent in any of these ways that seem to work for that particular situation if you use your heads, because they don't always work for everything. And you can use these and be crushed. I was in Tiananmen Square when the troops came in. I know a little bit about repression. But it was only a start. And then over the months, that got expanded and expanded. I, I had put notes in file cabinet, file drawers and envelopes of things. And I used it. And how an online struggle works, I had collected all these little pieces of paper and I had a living room. And I had the full living room filled with little piles of pieces of paper about different ways that an online struggle works, different insights with guides to pages of thinkers and quotations and what has actually happened in some of the cases I had studied and in other cases. And then I learned that you, you must not just think you're going to do this and quickly succeed because you say you're going to be nonviolent. And because you are going to be nonviolent, don't assume your opponent's going to be nonviolent. There are people who really just assume that. And naively, 
pure romanticism. You know what you're doing, and this regime is harsh. They're going to beat you and kill you if they get a chance, as well as simply lock you up or club you on the street. Because dictators do not like the people to learn that they have power potential. So don't be alarmed. Just as the people of Syria have continued with incredible casualties, but nothing compared to the casualties in Libya, and nothing compared to the casualties in Iraq with the United States invasion. I saw figures the other day, some 450,000 Iraqis killed during that war and the occupation, compared to the terrible casualties in Syria. I think it's up around 6,000 now. Nothing in comparison to what military means do. People sometimes justify violence because we're getting killed, we might as well do something. Just know that there's a suicidal step you take because your enemy always has greater power for violence than you do. So don't be stupid. Don't do the thing he wants you to do because he knows he can crush you if you lower the violence. That's why the political police put agents into resistance movements as they've done way, way back in the 19th century in Russia. For example, the third section of the political police did that and carried out even assassinations in the name of the revolutionaries in order to justify crushing them. And then this developed that. That Mr. 198 is merely, it's not a manual, it's not a smorgasbord, but it's, it's, they are options, these are possibilities. Some of them are totally unsuitable for most of any reasonable cause. It's very strange sometimes, but you have to arrange these, and do them in a certain kind of way that has, is effective. Just as a military strategist would plan, how do we use our military weapons? You don't have to go out and shoot at walls or people or anything like that. You have a plan. You know why you're going to do it that way. Now about struggle is more complicated, I argue, than this military struggle. And therefore you have to know how, to, how you're going to do it skillfully. So long, long before the Arab Spring, I'll take you back to the, a lot of the first part of the work you did, which was done against the background of communism. And you offered one of the most convincing arguments against mutually assured nuclear destruction that I've ever read. And it's not something that's widely, widely understood. Much of your work was done on civilian-based defense yes. as an alternative to nuclear war. Can you yes. tell us about, a little bit about that? Countries do get invaded. Groups try to seize control of the government. Gaddafi regime was not born out of love and kisses. It's from a military coup. The communists took over in the Soviet Union after peaceful non-violent struggle got rid of the Tsar system, carrying out a coup d'etat established by prearranged analysis, the kind of regime they wanted. We knew something about the Holocaust and the deliberate extermination of Jews and others under the Nazi empire. We know country, dictators existed in other countries, many in Latin America, Central America, for example, Guatemala and Salvador. What do you do? The traditional pastor's answer of the Peace Pledge Union in London and England was men will be, wars will cease when men refuse to fight. Not only does that beg the question, when will men refuse to fight? But how do you end the war system? And they thought that would end the war system, and I think it was naively wrong because people will give up violence if they don't absolutely need it. Military resistance was a very limited factor in India. Most of India gave up the option of military struggle against the empire, your empire, because they had another way another way to fight. We avoided 
unfortunately, because it could have happened differently, a major violent uprising among African Americans in the U.S. South, particularly, because they had a new nonviolent struggle way to struggle for equal rights. In case after case, where nonviolent struggle has been used, it provides an option to passivity, to surrender, and to violence. There's something else you can do. There are realistic alternatives. So you had to have a substitute. Now, in a time of nuclear weapons, a time of people were talking about unilateralism heavily here in the UK, I was on the first Aldermaster in March. I know the and I was an unofficial advisor to the Committee of 100, so I know a little bit about that kind of thing. But you have to have a substitute. So what could be a substitute means of defense. One of your leading military people in those days was Commander Sir Stephen King Hall, later Lord King Hall. And he, in 1958, maybe, seven, maybe, 59, maybe, he proposed a Royal Commission to examine, could you take nonviolent resistance and defend England against invaders and occupiers? I had a little bit to do with that, but he had his own ideas all the time, and that was good. But the idea came up. We also then edited a small publication on Peace News published it. It was called Civilian Defense, defense by ordinary civilian people, not military, not with military weapons, but with civilian weapons. Civilian weapons are psychological, social, economic, and political. You don't need the guns, maybe, at least work. And so we had a conference at Oxford that Sir Basil Littlehart came. Sir Basil Littlehart, many of you know, the famous military strategist, his study on strategy, the indirect approach. What is not so widely known is that he was a strong, had very strong interest in this kind of struggle that I'm talking about. In fact, I had a little bit of correspondence with him when I was from Norway. And I got back over here and I, I, I saw him sooner or later. And he, he scolded me for not keeping up the correspondence. He also had, and I visited his house in Midnaham, if I can pronounce it approximately right, that with him and Lady Kathleen. And he, he said, this struggle that you're doing, this work you're doing is very important. Don't give it up, you know. He also came to this special conference that we had at St. Hilda's College, I think it was, in late 1946, I think. Is that right? Maybe. This is Jamila Rocky <laughs> who works with me, and I have to draw on her. I think it's so. helped. She's an authority on this subject in her own right. She does a lot of international lecturing on it. So, Jim, the, the idea was that you would repl replace the idea of mutually assured destruction with training of, in civilian resistance? Yes, Is that but, but not, you didn't dump your military out and then say, oh, now what can we do now? You build up this capacity for people using this kind of resistance. And when it's prepared enough, when it's strong enough, then you can phase down the military as an antiquated weapon system. You don't need it anymore. Superior weapons have been developed. That was the idea. And this has been actually quite important. This was the basis of a book that was published by Princeton University Press called Civilian Based Defense. We had the page proofs of that in it was 1990 or 91, which we had taken to a conference in Moscow where we met a, a, a Lithuanian philosopher, Regina Menetaiti, and sh she brought it back to Vilnius, gave it to Audrius Bukevicius, who was the Director General of Defense for the, the now independent oriented Lithuanian government, because these were already parts of the Soviet Union, like Chechnya. These were already parts of the Soviet Union, and they organized and used their intuition their own experience and this book, and they got out of the Soviet Union with minute casualties. Twelve in Lithuania, eight in Latvia, 
and nobody did in Estonia. And you were actually a consultant to those we countries? We consulted to the government. So, in a way, you, you, your first major success of your writings was as a consultant to, to governments who were under the power of the Soviet Union at that point. I suppose you could say that, but not only... I was, my writings, writings with Bruce Jenkins were not the only source. They had their own conclusions about the inadequacy of violence. They had had major military histories and violent histories going back centuries. Go to their graveyard, you'll see the statues. They conducted guerrilla struggles against the Nazis and against the communist occupation. They were not naive. They chose then, let's build on what we can do ourselves and also learn from this. So that was the, the background of the work you'd been doing. And then you, you went to Harvard University and, and, and taught a program there. And that's where you met uh, Colonel Bob Helvey, who'd been a, who was a Vietnam War veteran. Yes. And he took you to, well, really smuggled you into, into Burma. And yeah. this is where, From Dictatorship to Democracy, the book which is now we've seen in, in almost every country recently, which has been undergoing these changes, and um, really is, is the book that at the moment that you're most famous for. So how did that come about? Sometimes the name slips in my mind at the moment, and I could get some help if I need it over here. Uh, I, I, did not come about when I was in liberated Burma under the Korean ethnic group control, the Korean National Army. But he, the, the exiles from Burma had offices sometimes in Bangkok, Thailand, even though the Thai government was never quite comfortable with that. I'm trying to think, what's his name? Asked me to write. Do you remember? No. That's not it. Yeah? And these were Burmese activists who asked you to write the book? Yeah, he was the editor of this exile democratic anti, anti dictatorship monthly newspaper. And he asked me to write for it. to help the Burmese. But I didn't know Burma in depth. To think how a, this kind of struggle can be used in a given situation, you have to know the situation in depth. And I didn't know that. But I had been doing studies for several decades on dictatorships, on totalitarian systems, on revolution, and on nonviolent struggles. So I could pull the strands together into a series of articles. I think there were nine. And that became From Dictatorship to Democracy, which they published in their journal in maybe 93, if I remember right. And this became then in English and in Burmese and then we got it translated into four ethnic languages of Burma. I thought that was it. We didn't have copies in the United States at their offices. I got burps. <laughs> I should uh, do the honors here with the water. I don't know whether that helps or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can, I mean, we can take suggestions from the audience on that. We had a Burmese, we had five or six copies of, a, of the, all these essays put together in English and Burmese, printed in Bangkok. And sometimes we made photocopies of that. Someone who got a, a photocopy of that took it <coughs> to Serbia, to Belgrade, and gave it to the organization Civic Initiatives. In the meantime, Robert Helvey, the Vietnam War 
Colonel went with <coughs> to offer a workshop for Serbian opposition groups, the youth group Otpor, which means resistance. And there he brought a set of the politics of nonviolent action with him. And Sergei Popovic, who began, was the leader of the Otpor group and the a great hero of the revolution, and who still had great insight into this kind of struggle in various places, he was credited with, uh, as an influence on the Arab Spring, for example. And Sergei saw this, aha, there are sources of power. The sources are uncertain. You can regulate the degree to which the regime gets those sources of power. If you can shrink the availability of those sources of power by restricting the obedience and cooperation of the people and of institutions, then the power of that regime, however dictatorial, will be limited and potentially cut off. In the rest of the film you didn't see, Bob Heavily is illustrating this by holding a, a book up with his fingers. Each one of these represents one of the sources of power, authority, human cooperation, repression, economic control, sanctions, and so forth. And you lift those sources of power away, the book, the book comes down, the government comes down. Very simple, terrifyingly simple for some regimes. And that, from dictatorship to democracy then, really, um, it just caught fire. It, it, it spread later all not, over the world. It, slowly. It first, it first spread from Bangkok. A student from Indonesia found it in a bookstore window, took it back, and then an Indonesian edition was published with a forward by Abdurrahman Wahid, who later was who headed the largest Muslim organization in the world and later was president of Indonesia. He wrote a forward to it. It started spreading in the other direction back from Bangkok. What had happened in, in Serbia when this ruthless dictator was brought down, it started being noticed in other places, including Georgia and Ukraine. And then it's happened to a couple of three places. This isn't supposed to happen, you know. This isn't the way things happen. And it was overwhelmingly nonviolent in all these cases, fortunately for with effectiveness. And it spread from there. And now it, that piece of, is in 34 languages on our website. There are some, most of them are in print. Some of them are only in translations and, and available electronically. Why do you think From Dictatorship to Democracy has been so successful? Well, first of all, we didn't, we didn't expect that. I thought that at the end of the Burmese edition, that's it. And these other things just started happening. And we don't know exactly how they happened, except that people notice. I think it's been successful because people have been quietly desperate. They've been hungry. If there's something can be done. So we don't suffer all of these terrible plights that people for these several decades have been suffering. So we don't have to go through another war with all of that destruction, which ends up killing more people than it possibly could be supposedly saving. You know. But I think that the hunger for that, and then the, I egoistically think that maybe the analysis might be approximately correct. We, we sensed that because people were writing for us. I don't remember how many people were saying the same thing. We thought this was written for us and from totally different countries and totally different religious groups, totally different societies and parts of the world. That piece is now in four indigenous African languages that you would not use. But, oh, there'd be an English and French maybe Portuguese. No, no, it's in four others, including American and Ethiopia, and others I don't even know the names of. But so we've heard some languages of Congo even. It, it's all uh, the, uh, the Arabs in the southern and Asian places. These illegal editions were 
translated and, and printed in Russia. Jamila discovered there four translations that didn't clear it with us about terminology. The terminology in this field is different. It didn't even, even exist in English. That's one reason my new book, Sharp's Dictionary of Power and Struggle, not my title, that Oxford University Press had just published. You can find it there. Over almost 900 deaf t divine terms. Look at this special terminology here. And that is, in this field, as you can see, what is happening, and then a greater analysis of how it works and why it fails. This, those factors at the end of that 1973 book. And now, it, how implementation, work on how it applied to civilian defense against helping countries like last year, the Soviet Union. And now it, it, it transformed in this way for liberation struggles, as you've seen, from dictatorship to democracy. And governments don't like this. Some governments don't like this. So, you know, I'm going to open it up to the floor in a minute so, so that people can ask you questions about the current yeah. situations in the Arab Spring. Yeah. But finally, I kind of like to think of you almost like the Queen and her Prime Ministers. You're one of the few people, if not the only people, in the world who has constantly has revolutionary group leaders, people conducting non-violent struggles from all corners of the world coming to your office in Boston. What, what are the things that they ask you and what are the mistakes do you think that they make that you see most, most often made? They often ask us to tell them what to do. I don't do that. And some of them are quite disappointed. Because if I had done it, I would, the answers probably would have been wrong. And I would have helped to mess them up. But what we've learned including the Syrians and others, how they can learn and become competent to plan their own strategies by their own efforts. But they don't start with the, that capacity. There are people who think, oh, we know how, we already know what to do. And that's why you have many crushed, failed remove, movements without planning, without preparation, without understanding. Hence, not only Tiananmen Square and its disaster, but those struggles were similar ones happening in maybe 350 cities of China. But without planning, without preparation, without contingency planning, you have to learn how to do this, which we can talk about if people are interested. OK, so we'll open up to the floor now. Who has the first question? Yes. Okay. Uh, Jean, I'm from Iran, and um, first of all, thank you for the help that you've given to the movement in Iran. Um, it's illegal to hold your books. People are flogged and thrown into prison for even reading it and downloading it. But I'm going to ask you a what to do question. Um, the youth in Iran are very um, disillusioned by the fact that the brutality of the violence used against them has, in a sense, stopped um, any kind of street protest or anything that they can organize because they feel they're not just fighting the regime, but they're fighting um, Russia and China or other countries that have economic interest mm -hmm. in maintaining mm -hmm. the status quo. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? How can they get themselves back organized and together again? I don't know exactly. Again, because I don't know your situation in depth. First of all, extreme repression probably was not a surprise to many of your people, but maybe they were surprised at the extremity of it. It probably shouldn't have been. Regimes do terrible things when they are frightened. And nonviolent struggle is more frightening to oppressive regimes than anything else they can do because it's more difficult for the regime to crush and deal with. We were honored by the interest that was taken in our work by opposition groups and very pleased to see it was cited in the treason trials 
as one of the arguments for sending these people to prison because they had read some of this material. But foreign assistance to oppressive regimes is not something new. The particular who is the helper here and who is the helper there, that varies. But you expect that kind of assistance to come from regimes that themselves are worried this would spread to their country. Getting uh, the, the Russian isn't the best example. There's one case is when uh, I said there were four illegal translations in Russian, and the Georgina engineered to get them evaluated to get a, a better single translation. When that translation was in the printers in Moscow, we were told, the FSB, the successors of the KGB, raided the place. What is this? This book is a bomb. And ordered the prison press to stop. It was published anyhow, and the manuscript was taken outside of Russia. And then two bookstores in Moscow caught on fire. That is a mild deal way of dealing with the control of this that you know far better in more extreme cases. You have to build in. So you don't choose. There's some methods of non sir that are very crudely defiant. You don't march that wisely. You do not march down the street toward the soldiers with machine guns. There are probably are people who have done that. Well, I know there are people who have done that in Burma, for example. That's not a wise thing to do. But there are other things that are much more extreme you don't need to do. Instead of doing marching down the street, you could have everybody stay at home. Total silence of the city. Everybody at home. Silent. You think the regime will notice? You demonstrate the solidarity of the population in that way. You find different ways. Exactly how you do it, how you overcome that problem now, I'm not sure. I don't know enough. But certainly your country people could do this and think it through as I'm sure there must be people there working on these problems more effectively. But don't be surprised by the brutalities. The U.S. government was making claims we have to intervene in Libya maybe because they're threatening to kill people. As though they didn't kill people in, re in the revolution against the tyrant. That was nothing new, you know. And not and dealing with the question of what if you go into violence, how many people are going to be killed? Will that contribute to your success or to your failure? You got to be smart. This takes time and energy. That's why in the in the this guide to self liberation. It's on our website. It says, know your own situation in depth. No nonviolent struggle in depth. And we help you with a condensed version of the Greek hard readings. It's only 900 pages in English. <laughs> and if you're not interested in reading 900 pages, you're not interested in getting rid of the dictator. <laughs> it's quite seriously. And you have to learn how to think strategically. Okay, next question. Um, thank you. I really well, love, I suppose, is the word, the, how you locate the discussion around tactics within an analysis of power. But I wanted to ask you whether you had any observation about power within social movements and opposition movements. You analyze the, the power of the dictator and the power of the state, but how, how is power played out within the internal workings of social movements and opposition movements. And I mention that because back in the day, I started to learn how to campaign in the trade union movement. And there, for all its failings, I knew how accountability and power played out. But in all the other NGOs or campaigns I've been associated with since, I'm not so sure. And I wonder on the, in the larger movements with you have studied, whether you are concerned about the internal power dynamics in such movements. I can be concerned about it without knowing much about it. 
because I have not studied the dynamics in, within resistance movements. I know that they are very important. I know they can really mess up the movement. There will be groups operating within those movements to take it over for their own political purposes. They have a political ideology and doctrine of their own, which, which is one of the reasons some of the Russian movements oh, it's crazy, uh, by the boss controlling them on the inside. And that's a very difficult situation. There are other people who have the unanimity policy. We must all you agree and unanimously agree, and that will form our strategy. And to me, that's utter nonsense. And very, the very disruptive into some of the occupied movements in the United States is my impression, although I'm not an authority on those movements. But it's very difficult and very important. And if people like you and others can learn and how best that could, should be organized and conducted uh, itself, that will be a, make that knowledge available. That would be very useful. <laughs> okay. um, I thought you said something very interesting, Jean, that you said regimes do terrible things when they're frightened. And I'm just wondering about the role of fear for people in power and dictatorships and regimes. And um, say, looking at the Arab Spring and what happened to Gaddafi, and members of his supporters, whether you have any thoughts on how to bridge that difficulty, um, that whether opposition groups should and can offer the hand of friendship rather than that of revenge. I don't know whether that's possible. I'm just, you know, just looking at the, the role of fear within these situations. Bridge the fear between the resistors and and the dictators or the regimes. I mean, I'm just thinking about... the soldiers, for example. Yes, exactly. Yeah, because you said that regimes do terrible things when they're frightened. So I'm just looking at how but do you reduce the, that, the that fear. Yes. The regimes are not a monolith. They have internal problems within them. Some sympathizers for the revolution, even. If you've seen the rest of Dory's film, there's pictures in S Serbia of someone offering flowers to soldiers, befriending the soldiers. I've seen sisters in, in China of them offering some food and water to soldiers, the same soldiers as some did some of the killing later. You know. If you can get the soldiers to be uneasy about their horrible assignments so that they shoot above the heads or they somehow don't obey orders exactly, there's a delay. And in extreme cases, mutiny. Dangerous action for the soldiers. They can be shot on the spot for that and have been, you know. Rarely, I wouldn't count on the people at the top changing much, except if one group of them thinks they can be, take charge of the whole movement and the new become the so not the rest of these so-called people in charge. But it's a very difficult situation, but not in terms of just thinking we can be holding hands with Stalin or Hitler and everything will be fine if only if we forgive them and love them. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic, but <laughs> there are there are people. There was one American pacifist writer, Milton Mayer, a very important man, who wrote some years ago, the supreme question to be faced by Robert was this, can you love Hitler? And they say, hell no, you know, is my response. But you can hate him and still struggle skillfully using these nonviolent methods and you don't have to assassinate him or kill off all his soldiers in order to win. In the uh, early part of this immediately past decade, after the Serbian revolt in 2000, George Soros, it seems to me, began funding what amounted to summer camps in the Balkans with Otpor people, people from the old B-92 radio station in Belgrade, mm -hmm. sort of summer camps for teaching nonviolent revolution. Do you have any idea how much that had to do with spreading these ideas among the, 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 the revolutionaries of the Arab Spring? No. I know nothing about those camps. Our attempts to get funding from George Soros have resulted in zilch. <laughs> we even get pro forma 
crude letters from his assistants, not crude, but pro forma automatic letters are already printed out, uh, rejecting our applications. He's probably a well, very well-intended person, and he probably does very good work. I, I don't know much about it, and he doesn't express any interest in what we've been doing. Gene, you're in a slightly interesting position in that you advocate self-liberation, that that governments really shouldn't intervene in the internal politics of countries. But do you think that Western democracies should assist in um, democracy groups non in pushing non-violent struggle tactics, your tactics, in countries like Iran? I think it depends on what they're competent to do and what their judgment is as to what needs to be done and if they're able to do it. Mostly I don't trust them. Because they don't know what the hell this is. They don't really understand it. So if they give advice, they will often try to push their own decision as to what needs to be done, as was done in Zimbabwe, for example. Outsiders trying to give advice, instructions to the Zimbabweans how to struggle. And the advice was always wrong, according to a colleague of mine who knew a lot about what was going on. So it's, it's far best if you have an issue there. And don't take CA money if it's available. Don't take CIA controls. I know one Iranian I met years ago who said, we had CIA money for our youth group and so forth and so on. And boom, that policy changed and the money was cut off and our group was less starving. You know, because you, they couldn't carry through because their policy changed. It was directed from outside, don't trust that. Would I, it wasn't Parnell, maybe it was Parnell in Ireland, who said, to the Irish peasants who were struggling against British landlordism. Rely on yourselves alone. This was Gandhi's message too. Don't depend on someone else coming to save you. They may not ever get there and they may come without, with shackles as well. Hi, uh, my name's Tim G. We've exchanged some emails about a book that I wrote which was inspired by your ideas, Counterpower. Um, I've been um, talking about these ideas around the country and two, two questions keep coming back. Um, the first one is um, how do we stop the movement from becoming, as, if the movement wins then and if the movement takes power, how do we stop them from being as authoritarian as those mm -hmm. ones before? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the second one that keeps coming back is um, how can those of us that, for whom, for many of us our primary struggle is against the dictatorship of corporate power, and how can these ideas be translated into something which is a little bit more complex, um, and which has um, a, a kind of, uh, which seemed quasi-democratic because there are elections every so often. Mm -hmm. Both questions are very good, and I can't do it in three seconds. And I don't know the answer to most of them. The, in the final chapter or two of the politics of nonviolent action, there's a warning about this stage. You brought down one regime. How do you not get the new Bolshevik regime or the new Ayatollah regime stepping in and taking charge? It's very important. There are some suggestions there, very generic suggestions. Also, one way this happened is in the midst of confusion, some group seizes control of the state apparatus, a coup d'etat. To my knowledge, we are the only organization that has a handbook on how to prevent and de defeat a coup d'etat if it's attempted. It's called the Anti-Coup. There are copies on our website for download. We have copies for sale at our office. And it is now in what languages? French? And what? <coughs> Louder. French, Spanish, and All right, there's a start. <laughs> they need to be in the languages of Africa, where coup d'etat has been the plight to prevent the development of civilian democratic <coughs> governments for decades now. Coup d'etat is often engineered with foreign intelligence agencies like the American CIA involvement in Chile, ousting a democratic government when setting up Pinochet's regime. You have to know how to, it's a serious defense problem, which you should get all kinds of people of different 
political persuasions as those are Democrats to, to support and conduct. How do you change the corporate system? I haven't got a solution to that. There have been important and good groups working almost for a century, but certainly for many decades, how you do it. The various versions of socialism, whether it's guild socialism, uh, libertarian kind of socialism, state socialism, democratic socialism, and on down. And the answers don't seem to be very perfect. It seems that some problem of bureaucratic control is a big problem. It's major work is done, needs to be done on that. I haven't done it. Maybe you and others and people you know and work with can get a good start on that, and I would encourage that. Okay. Thank you. Just Hello, Gene. I'm, I've, I've worked with seven human rights groups, and I've actually written a 1,700-page book with Hitler at the middle of it, and also did the affidavits for Venunu. And I, when I was in university, we had Walden Pond around the corner. Mm -hmm. uh, the world is, has, has moved on since then, and the people who consolidate power are much more wicked and better organized than they were in those days. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what the role of the individual and of nonviolence really is in this. I mean, there was a plot against Hitler in the early 1930s, mm -hmm. a bomb under the stage. If it had mm -hmm. killed Hitler, there was one individual mm -hmm. against an individual. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, how do you feel about nonviolence after doing this all your life? I mean, do you feel absolutely committed to it? Should the Syrians go on dying by the tens of thousands um, uh, if, if Assad manages to stay in power? Um, is collective action always the way to do it, do you think? I don't think there's any action that's not corporate action, not group action, that can get rid of dictators. Individuals cannot get rid of dictators. This being good or committed is not enough. You have to work with other people. You have to get rid of the sources of power. Those sources of power are not made available purely by individuals but by groups of people and by institutions. So maybe it's not the answer an individual's approach to moral nonviolence likes to hear, but uh, that's my opinion. Well, I was actually thinking about nuclear weapons. I mean, Mordecai Venunu spent 18 years in prison for revealing the Israeli atomic bomb project. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked all my life on nuclear weapons issues, and we've never been able to make any progress against this thing. Uh, Fukushima didn't really bring it to an end in Japan. Um, how confident are you that a collective action will always triumph? It won't. I don't let you focus on converting. The approaches of various groups think you can get rid of war and the war system by confronting it, by demonstrating it, by having massive rallies and campaigns. I don't think you get rid of war by confronting it and opposing it. You get rid of war by having something else that's credible that people can do instead. You, I was on the first all of the march. I know about that kind of thing. Maybe not as much as you do, probably. But I know that it can happen that somebody, you feel good about it. But feeling good does not change things. You get rid of weapons by not needing them anymore. It is superseded by some new way of conducting the struggle instead. You're not being naive about the dangers of this or that regime. You're not saying let's all just be good or just witness, which is a good word in many ways, but a very insufficient word. You have to build a substitute. I have chapters on that in my book, uh, Social Power and Political Freedom, along with a number of other chapters that might be of interest. Gene, just on that Syria point, at the moment we're beginning to see a non-violent struggle taking place alongside elements which seem to be armed. Do you think a mixed approach can work, a non-violent struggle alongside an armed struggle? This is a popular view. I've heard that for a long time. You think you have so much here that's positive, and so much here's about it, so let's put it together. Very naive. The way violent struggle works and operates and produces its result, and the way nonviolent struggle operates and does produce its results are opposite. 
So what is, if you had the violent people helped by the nonviolent people, and say, in addition to the time, we were going to have some other people go on hunger strike in the middle of a war on the Western Front, or we're going to have people refuse to use guns on the middle of the war. That's not going to help the war. But similarly, violence in the midst of a nonviolent struggle is a tool of the oppressor to trick the people in to accepting violence because that is what the regime wants them to use because it is confident and equipped and prepared to use that use their the regime's violence that overwhelmingly much greater than anything the rebels could choose it's mobilized to it together and well that regime violence often perpetrated by agents within their political police that will help the that will help the regime maintain control and defeat the opposition. Okay. Yes, thank you, Jean. It's been wonderful. I'm a photojournalist, and I specialize in work very much uh, about women and children and humanitarian issues and so on. And one of the things that's really struck me these last three or four weeks, particularly what's happening in Libya today, and I'd be very interested in your view in behind just what you just recently sa just said, which is basically you have regimes that want to perpetuate and the fear and so on. And then you hear what's happening in Libya today, and I, and, and I have friends and colleagues that are working there. And you have got the revolutionaries that are actually mimi miming exactly what Gaddafi had done, I, the, creating the most extreme kind of terror and 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 miming exactly what he had done in terms of creating fear, of cutting off fingers, of uh, of interrogations, where you have medicines on frontier that's actually abandoned. They said we don't want to have people being brought in that that are being asked by us to help them get their health back so they can go back for the interrogations. So you, for me, I, I find that what's really curious, and I would really be interested in your view, is you, you, you've got these revolutionaries that are actually perpetuating the kind of fear and agony that the regimes were perpetuating for years. Why are they still doing it? Is it tribal? Is it something inside of this insidious behavior? And uh, how can we outsiders in the West and everywhere else have any respect for that? You know much more about Libya than I do by far. No. <laughs> I don't know much about Libya. <coughs> Libya was not a case of a nonviolent people power revolution. It started off nonviolently mm -hmm. and quickly became military. Mm -hmm. How? Because a Libyan general of the Gaddafi regime defected. He went to the rebels, here I am, I defect. Here are my soldiers, and here are my guns. We're here to help. Within about a few weeks after that, he's in rebel headquarters. He's killed. Two weeks before he defected, Gaddafi and his son predicted this struggle will end in a civil war. My hypothesis, and it's a hypothesis, is this was a high level a Jean provocateur planted specifically to get the rebel movement to shift to a violent struggle. The Gaddafi regime with their superior military capacity was confident they could control. The rebels found that even with that soldier and his guns and his weapons, they was inadequate. So they didn't get the French Air Force and the United States assistance and NATO's assistance. And even then it took months. When Libya and, and Tunisia were a matter of weeks. The assumption that violence is going to be quick, nonsense. The assumption that violence is a tool of liberation, nonsense. As the Libyan struggle was ending up, there were Americans talking about what, now Americans are talking about what, now what should we have Libya be and do? They were heavily involved militarily. The assumption that you get, improve revolutionary purposes by military struggle is nonsense. And what you describe, it's 
really confirming the very things I suspected. Okay, let's squeeze in a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, Jean, this comes, uh, is triggered by a question just this evening here, where um, he said, what do you do about the revolutionary side of things becoming authoritarian? And I want to ask you, um, just developing on from that, w more to the point, when a revolution really isn't a revolution, when actually it's just a power grab by the forces that are. Mm. So let's say, for example, on the walls there, the Romanian revolution was not a revolution. Mm -hmm. It was just stay in power, get rid of Ceausescu, but stay in power. Mm -hmm. And they've got more power than they ever had. Mm -hmm. I said, but in your analysis, what revolutions are right now sort of fraud revolutions? It's just a power grab. I don't have that typology. The problem you state is genuine. Everybody who says they're revolutionary is not. Every revolution they call a revolution is probably not. This is one of the many areas in which our terminology and definitions are very important. The so-called October Revolution in Russia, for example, was a coup d'etat by the Bolsheviks and with the help of the Mensheviks. You have to, like, you get you avoid that situation to some degree, but not even get out of it completely. First of all, by conceptualizing how a revol a popular people power revolution can be conducted, what are the danger signals, how to prevent one group getting control of that movement, as was the issue that was raised a few minutes ago, and how do you carry that through successfully? Because nonviolent so has a way of diffusing power, empowering people. They learn what they can do and whatever situation may arise. But you have to know what are the danger signals when one group is trying to seize control, maybe on the original French model or the Bolshevik model or the Maoist model, and how you can carry this out nonviolently and with moderate degree of success, but still with problems coming up. And not think just because you bring, just because you bring down one regime, does not mean you'll go on your goal yet. Okay. I should maybe add that this transition period is very important. Robert Helvey, who, who you just saw his picture briefly. I'm sorry, boops. <laughs> Here comes. You saw his picture briefly. He's now working on a guide. He wrote a very important book on strategic nonviolent conflict, which we have on sale at the Albert Einstein Institution and is on our websites in several languages. He's now working on a new book on this. this, this that's, he says is that's the first half. The second half is how you carry this through the dangerous period that you have focused on. And that's very important. Yep, just the lady there in the grey jumper. Then we'll take one more question and... Jean, thank you very much for your contribution. I also come from Iran. Uh, there are some points I wanted to say. We had a revolution in 1979, as mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And then after, you know, 33 mm -hmm. years now, we have a disaster in the country. Mm -hmm. Now, we are facing multiple problems in solving the problem that we are facing. We're facing the religion, which sometimes is used to suppress people. At the same time, uh, we have a wealthy country, which is used against uh, you know, suppressing the people. Now we have countries like China and Russia, which are helping the Iranian regime, and the, some Western countries, which import you know, the technology. Uh, all of this together, we have the people's resistance against the regime at the same time. Now, this, this is a very complex situation we have in Iran. It's not very straightforward. Mm -hmm. But my specific question is that, you know, as the regime is somehow, maybe we are f hoping to fall apart, some elements of the regime, either at the top or, you know, uh, in the middle, uh, turn to the people joining the people in a way. 
Now, my question is that where do we have the red line? Where do we stop accepting them or believing in them to be in part of the people? you know, to be supporting the people and actually joining the people. And what are the elements that we can use to actually uh, um, believe in them and, you know, uh, somehow trust them to, you know, to join the people in the nonviolent way? I don't know. Um, it's a real problem. I would think in addition to what you say, which is serious enough, you may find some external intelligence agency deciding to assist some part of those so-called opposition groups and engineer that to get a new solution favorable for, for the United States or whoever. And they're not going to tell you what they're doing in advance. But how you manage this is, is a tough one. And I hope and respect the the seriousness and the intelligence and the judgment of important Iranian people because you have done historically such good things at many times in your history and it's important now in this new difficult situation a greater challenge than the peoples of Iran and Persia and all the rest have, have ever experienced you have a new challenge an outsider like me can't tell you what to do if I did you shouldn't believe me Trust yourselves. Research, investigate it, and think. And think, and think, and think. Okay, we're going to take one last question from the back of the room. Thanks. Um, just a very short question. Is there a point in a time when it's so much easier to mobilize large amounts of people that nonviolent resistance can become um, both a weapon against the state but also a tool of the state? in that rival powers in, within a country can mobilize large amounts of people um, to just force one interest against another, and whether that might be an increasing feature of, of a social media age. I mean, I, I, the, as an example, it might be the two, a red and a yellow movement in Thailand where huge amounts of people are brought out to serve different interests. I think potentially that can happen. And I don't have an answer to it, but you're aware of it, so maybe you can help think that through and do whatever investigations may be required. But don't believe anybody who thinks they've got all the answers for you. They're probably 99% wrong. But you have to have this broad problems, and you have to have many people involved in thinking through how do we solve this kind of thing. If there are studies that exist, like what we have on Black and Coup d'etat, great, use them. If those studies don't exist, you're going to have to go through very carefully. But be very careful as to how this operates. You need, that's why you need to understand nonviolent circle and how it operates. And the dangers and advantages of certain kinds of methods and what kinds of things you must avoid. Jean Good luck. Finally, what have you learned from this past year of incredible events, and what is your message for people in the future going forward? Well, I have been pleased and shocked and surprised at the numbers of countries in which people have risen up and amazingly maintained nonviolent discipline to a remarkable degree <coughs> and cast off fear. This is something Gandhi was always saying, cast off fear. And I thought, he's really getting a kind of extreme. I'm not sure this is quite right. Maybe, it's, maybe you control fear only. But in, in Syria and country after country, people say, I'm not afraid anymore. There were people interviewed in, I don't remember whether it was Egypt or in Syria, who say, use my name. I'm not afraid anymore. The audacity 
This is something tyrants cannot tolerate. If people are no longer afraid of that's why they have the political police and the tortures and all that kind of thing, to make people frightened. And when people lose their fear and use their brains and plan skillfully and act bravely and maintain nonviolent discipline, and you have a wise, grand strategy carefully thought through and planned, you have a good chance of succeeding. And I've learned that this possible type of success is more likely to happen now than ever I expected. I think this know-how, you know, this, the old story that this genie was hidden in a bottle and kept corked in, they could do magic. The genie, but the genie somehow escapes the bottle. And somebody's trying to, they had to put it back in. They couldn't put it back in. The knowledge of how people can free themselves has escaped the genie in the bottle. They, it is now there. It can't be put back again. It can be crushed here and there. You can slaughter those people here and there. But the knowledge of how people can struggle to be free is there and spreading throughout the world. And you can expect quite amazing struggles in the next few years and from then on. Gene Sharp, thank you very much for joining us. And inevitably, I was working part time. I was a guide to a blind social worker, a kind of seeing, a human seeing eye dog, you know. And eventually, the FBI came and called at my house. And my mother was visiting from Ohio, and she said, "Well, he's at work." So they found me at the office of the. Of, the program for assisting the guy, the blind at that time. I I was reading on the bus, right, traveling this around, guiding this gentleman around. I, I was carrying some collections of Gandhi's writings at the time, the very day they arrested me, and they looked at them rather curiously. So that, that's it. <laughs> and then and then you went to prison and you served nine months. Oh, that was. I was sentenced to two years. <coughs> Technically, they could have given me a 14-year sentence, but they, the judge only gave me two years. Out of that, you're allowed certain for good behavior or something, parole at the end of nine months. And nine months and 10 days after my imprisonment, I, I was let loose, subject to reporting every week. But during that very dark period, I suppose, in your life when you were being t sent to prison, you had a, a very kind of unlikely mentor and source of support, and that was Albert Einstein. Yes. Albert Einstein, <laughs> I never met him. I got scolded by the executive of his estate years later for not having gone down to Princeton, New Jersey, to see him. But I thought, well, that's too much, and you have to get special permission to travel outside of your court district. So I waited, and then I was shocked. One day, went to read the headlines of the paper that he was gone. But he had Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for uh, coming. Um, it's been, I'm Rory Arrow, it's been my great privilege for the past two and a half years to be making a film about a man who I think will probably be seen as one of the most important political thinkers of our generation. I can, I'd love to read you a piece from the, the Times today, which describes uh, Jean's work. And it says, not perhaps since Machiavelli has a book had such impact in shifting the balance of power between the rulers and the ruled. Unlike Machiavelli, however, Gene Sharp is not advising princes how to hold on to power. He is telling millions living under dictatorship how to liberate themselves. Um, how to Start a Revolution, the film, has 
been doing the film festival tour around the world and um, I've been consistently berated for not asking many of the questions I should, uh, should have asked. So I'm delighted to be able to um, redress some of the balance tonight. So first of all, we're going to show you uh, uh, the trailer of the film and then um, we're going to have a conversation with Jean. My name is Gene Sharp, and this is the work I do. This is a technique of combat. It is a substitute for war and other violence. So that mixture, and also we knew a little bit about Gandhi. We knew a little bit about the nonviolent struggle in India. We didn't know much about other kinds of nonviolent struggle. So you put those problems together, and those old answers being inadequate, and trying to learn more. And the more you learned, you mo the more I learned there was to learn. And I kept trying to do that. And in, in, 19, in the early 1950s, the Korean War broke out. And you conscientiously objected to that war. And you were arrested by the FBI. Can you tell us about your arrest and what you were doing at that time and then oh, what happened? I had chosen a particular kind of conscientious objection, the most obnoxious kind, I guess, existed. <laughs> of civil disobedience, you know, I could have got exemption as a content objector. The U.S. laws allowed for that without much of a problem. But I was determined to, not to say, well, let me out, but take them, it's okay. And so I refused to fill out more applications for content objector status. I refused to carry a draft card. I refused to report for physical examination. And I, this originally started in Ohio. And this time I was living in Brooklyn, New York. And, eventually, and then I was working there. I was doing studies part-time on Gandhi, working on my first book on Gandhi which I think I completed in 1965, only published in India. Three case histories of Gandhi's use of non so three very different cases. Where did it all start? What made you want to do this kind of work? I didn't know this kind of work. I worried for many years as an undergraduate what I would do. And what I should profession I should accept or choose. And every time I got interested in one, I discovered there was somehow inadequate. And I came into this almost accidentally, but not really. By I always learned to ask the question behind the question and not be satisfied with the answers I might get. And the questions in, in 1948, 49, 50, 51, had to do with the Second World War, Nazism, the Holocaust, had to do with Stalin in the Soviet Union, had to do with, do with European colonialism that claimed ownership of most of the rest of the world, of racial segregation in the United States, <coughs> of people often feeling helpless and powerless, of the very beginnings, the very earliest beginnings of the civil rights movement, who did lunch counter sit-in, for example, in 1949, I think, in Columbus, Ohio, which was in the north, supposedly. I was worried about 
military conscription because I had become a kind of a pacifist or worried about the problem of what do you do if you are attacked. So in writing my letters to the draft board, I remember I wasn't just writing about war. I, somehow in those letters, totalitarianism came in. As we speak, somebody is doing it in Iran. As we speak, somebody is doing it in Egypt. As we speak, somebody is doing it in Venezuela. I'm telling you the facts I know. To be counted as a threat to a tyrant is a matter of pride, I would say. It means we're effective. It means we're relevant. It means out of this very small office, we produce work uh, that, that threatens regimes. Jean Sharp's tactics and, and, um, and, and theories are being practiced on the streets of Syria as we speak now. It shows that what Jean was talking about year after year after year, there are realistic alternatives to violent conflict. Unless they have something instead of violence and war, they will go back with violence and war every time. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Jean Sharp. Jean, welcome back to London. I think you spent uh, many sort of happy years here yourself as a, as a young man. Tell me, 